I, I have a word for us this morning, and I think it's going to encompass several areas, um, which might make some people nervous, but I, I, I feel like there are people who are nervous um, over the events of this past week. Uh, some people ain't. A lot of people are. Um, and uh, so a lot of what the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about, I am not a political person online at all. Uh, I, I, I do that. I want to be sometimes. Uh, many times this last week, this last week I have wanted to be political, um, but that's not who I am. Uh, God's called me to be an encourager, to be a teacher, to lift people up. So that's what I do. With that said, um, I have I felt this week I, I, I made a, a basically a political post, but it really wasn't political. It was spiritual, and uh, and that's what's really been on my heart. And I wrote it down early this week, uh, and and, it, and I believe the Lord Lord has. Uh, inserted it in here, so uh, we're we're going to give you a little bit of of my uh, picture of America. Um, meanwhile, we are going to deal in the area of what uh, of what we started two weeks ago uh, regarding covenant relationships, and finally, we're going to kind of get a little bit of, of of a picture of what the Holy Spirit is talking to me about 2021 regarding. So we're going to do our best to get it all in there, um, and, and uh, if we don't get it all in there, we got next week. So, <clears throat> so I want to start this off today by just simply um, saying that I, I don't think your average Christian understands God's view of covenant relationship. Um, one of the biggest problems with uh, the... Uh, our, our culture here, the Western culture, has to do with the fact that we don't understand covenant unless you've had it really taught to you. And even when you have it taught to you, you have a tendency to lean um, on your old ways of thinking anyway. And so, so Christians, America, American Christians, have really a struggle with the concept of covenant relationships. And I think it is extraordinarily important for us as a body of Christ, as Christians, to understand God's view of covenant and how important covenant is to Him. Now, some people feel like covenant relationships with God is to where we can, as Christians, say, say, God, you've made a covenant with us. You better not fail. You better not do that. But see, here's the thing. The reason God uses covenant, and again, covenant is, is, is a God-ordained thing. People have perverted it, obviously. But the, the total, the total, um, the way covenant relationships, covenant relationships were in America before the, the, the white man came to America. It was in every, it, it's in every nook and cranny around the globe, covenant relationships. That means that the, the starting point of covenant was way back there during one man, one woman, when the, at the very beginning of time. You follow me on that? So covenant is a God-given idea. Now, why is it so important to God that we that we understand or that that there's covenant. Now it's not so that we can hold him and force him to keep his word. Now I mean some of y'all going so we can't force him to keep his word. You don't have to. He's God. He tells us in Scripture that I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not the son, or a son of man that I should repent. 
So God's not up there saying, no, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come into a covenant relationship with you so that, you, so, that I ha- so that I have to be held to an agreement. When mankind understands covenant relationship, then we understand the mentality, the mind, and the heart, and the life of who God is. I want you to make this very clear. That's why he operates inside a covenant. Is because us on our own, we can't understand how God operates. Us as Americans, we, you know, we, we, uh, we, you know, we, we see people get selfish and get and and try to break contracts and try to, you know, uh, you know uh, try to find people who are men of the word, right? And 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 God, that's that's God is a man of His word. His word is forever settled in the heavens. Say forever settled. That means he can, if he says it, he can never go back on it. And so when we under, begin understanding covenant relationships and covenant uh, covenant operations, I'm going to make sure I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got notes, but uh, amen. When we begin, then we, th- at that point, it's the starting point of us really understanding who God is. When I said, I do to Jessica on our wedding day, June 3rd, 1995. When I said, I do to Jessica, it was forever. And there's some times in in the 25 years that we've been married where um, I've wanted to lay hands on her. And and pray for her. Uh, (laughs) There, there's time, you know, it hasn't been all rainbows and unicorns, though, you know, it's been good. I enjoy her, she enjoys me. Um, but there's never been a time in 25 years that I've thought, I'm out of here. And again, I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody because I do believe God has, has, allowed people to do that for their uh just for because of (laughs) amen i'm not picking on that i'm just simply saying when you understand covenant relationship you understand that you ain't backing out that's one word i will never use during a wedding ceremony i won't even use the word in a wedding ceremony i've i've been i've been to wedding ceremonies where pastor will talk about the divorce rate so high in America. I ain't even using that lingo on your wedding day because I don't I don't even want to bring that thought pattern into it. I want to bring thought patterns of covenant into that relationship. That what you are doing here today is that you are entering a covenant between God and you and your mate. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And, and so, so, so that those words, till death do us part, that means something in covenant relationship. But see, when we begin understanding that, we can get a glimpse of who God is and understanding the nature of God. So when God makes a covenant with man, he will never turn his back on that covenant ever, 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 ever. Say ever. Ever. He will never turn his back on that covenant. Some people would say, Pastor Thad, uh, uh, God many times in scriptures allowed the the children of Israel when they were were doing things wrong in his sight. He allowed them to get into bondage. He didn't turn his back on it. he, He never said, my covenant's over. He didn't say that. Because he will never turn his back on covenant. Matter of fact, he'll stand at attention. He stood at attention for over 400 years while the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt waiting for them to call on the covenant. And they didn't do it until 425 years had passed. And then finally they were like, all right, 
We're miserable. And he goes, yeah, I've been sitting here thinking about the covenant I've made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? He, he, he never turned his back on covenant. Whenever they got things straightened out, what, where was God? Ready to move things back into position. That's why we're sitting here, what, 2,000 years later, more than that, and there's a little country in the middle of the Middle East that makes no sense in the world why they're still, how, how they could still be a nation. Every place around them, everybody around them hates them. And yet they're just still sit, sitting on the primest piece of property. People, people, bigger nations are afraid of them. It doesn't make sense. But God doesn't turn his back on covenant. That's, that's, that's why we need to understand covenant. That's why we need to understand that, uh, that, that when God calls us to covenant, it's more, it's more than just us coming to church and doing a job. It's relationships. Now, now our, our working definition of covenant is an intimate, intricate, and a binding relationship. And again, I, I, we spent one, one season, but I, I remember one part of the uh, uh, series I did was just on those three words, intimate, intricate, and binding. And the intimate is relationship. Uh, the binding means you never turn your back on it. And then we spent several weeks on the, the intricate, the, the d details, the little things. Intricate means there's little things that you put a lot of time into. Have you ever seen some, uh, a lady who is really good at stitching or, or uh, um, crocheting or knitting or whatever, and they have an intricate design? That means it's a very detailed um, effort on small areas. Amen. Y'all thinking a lot. Either, either I must be really, really good this morning or you're just really, really thinking a lot. <clears throat> it means a lot of attention is given to very little things. Amen. And, and so when we start getting through that, we, sp we spend a lot of time on a lot of little things that we need to make sure we, we, which I think kind of we might be doing here again, just on that area, just refreshing a couple things. Not today, uh, but over the course of the next couple weeks. Uh, because I think we can forget those things. Amen. Have you, ever, have you ever been really good at doing something, and then you didn't do it for a little while, and it took you a little while to get, to get refreshed where you're, you're really good at it again? In, in other words, you still remembered the concept, but to get really precise at it again, you had to really work at it again. It, you, it, right? Because it was such a talent, such a thing. Um, th that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Is that when covenant relationships, sometimes we, we, we don't hear certain things preached, we don't hear certain things talked about, so we can get a little lax in it, and we can... Uh, get a little sloppy in it, and so we need to hear it preached again so that we can get get back to where we need to be on it. Now, many people look at our covenant with God. Uh, most of the time when I preach on covenant, I'm preaching on interpersonal relationships because, again, most people want to have a relationship with God, uh, but they don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 his it's his body that is the problem. It's not it's not God that's the problem. Oh, I love God. Oh man, I'd do anything for God. God, you're amazing. But that person over there is a jerk. And don't tell me I need to love on them. Don't tell me I need to get along with them because they've lost it. They've lost any chance, right? So we spend a lot of time on that because I believe that is an area that that uh, we've got to get better at. Which 
kind of where we're going today. Um, but a lot of times when people start talking about the covenant that we have with God, they tell us that it's a different kind of covenant. You've probably heard this preached. Um, that the covenant that we have with God is the kind of covenant. A matter of fact, I've got a book back there that I started reading once because I bought it because it said covenant. And I was like, I like that book. And then, I, then, then the whole basis of the book was that God has everything and we have nothing. And yet he still chose to come into covenant with us. We'll see that, that there may be, I, I've only, that's the only book I've really ever read that has that mentality uh, that I've heard of a covenant like that. Um, but that's not how covenant works. You don't go into a covenant. A covenant is not is not an intimate, intimate, intricate, and a binding relationship between two or more people that unites one set of skills, one set of strengths, so that they both now have that set of skills. It is uniting your strengths to eliminate your weaknesses. And that's where most Christians miss it. They, that blows their brains out. They're like, no, God doesn't have any weaknesses. Except he does. He has one glaring weakness. Is that he gave access to earth. He gave, he gave the right and dominion and authority to to earth, to people in uh, body suits who, who have a body. He created Adam and Eve and gave them the authority and the dominion on this earth, and then he said, it's yours. Right? And so he has limited himself to what he can operate on this earth to he has to use a, 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 an earth suit. So when he wanted to bring, uh, when he wanted to bring redemption to man, he had to do it through his son, bringing him in through a womb of a woman, give him an earth suit to do what needed to be done. It ha he had to do it that way. Because that was something he was missing. And so, God, make sure I stay on track here. I want to get every place in my sermon right now, and i got to stay on track. So, God, knowing this, needed to come into a covenant with people, people on this earth, mankind on this earth, so that he could have all of us, all of our bodies, our mouths, our lives, our hearts, our actions, our finances, everything that we are, he has. And in return, we get all that he has. We get all of his blessings. All right? Are you all with me here? That's covenant. Is that we had a weakness that we were missing a lot. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we, were, that, that, that we were without hope in this world. Well, he gave us hope. That we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, where he gave us. He gave us uh, the, the wealth of Israel. So he gave us all of that. that. That was our weakness. Now it's our strength. His weakness is that he needed a body to work through. Listen, th th I heard someone say this this week, and man, it got, it got me so excited. But did you ever find it interesting? Now, I know, I know, I know some of you go, but Pastor Thad, it was a prophecy that had to come true. I know, but did you ever find it interesting that, that a prophecy would have focused on that not a bone in Jesus' body was broken. Now, some of you go, no, I don't find that inter interesting at all because, because the Passover lamb, right? Not one bone in that body was, were to be broken. 
Well, you understand why the Passover lamb, they, they couldn't break the bone in that Passover lamb. It's because it was pointing to Jesus. There were prophets, prophecies in Old Testament that say not a bone in his body would be broken. Well, see, again, the point there is, was, not, was not just about... I hope you guys are ahead of me on this one. The point of that, it wasn't just about not having a body a bone broken. That prophecy was pointing to Jesus, him hanging on the cross, and making a covenant with you and I. And so as he hung on that cross, and, 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 and again, all the whipping, all the stabbing, all the jabbing that took place on his body, and, and, and he hung on that cross, not a bone in his body was broken. Now what did, you, what did God not have that he needed? A body. And one of the keys... When Jesus hung on that, his body was his 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 flesh was tore apart, but his body was not to be broken. His bones were not to be broken. And I've I heard I heard this come up this week at some point in my people I've I listened to uh, teaching, but the, he, they, they said they, uh, they they just made the point. They said the reason is because God doesn't ever want his body to be. To be at, to be broken, to be hurt, be hurting, or to be, uh, how does? He doesn't want division in his body. He wants his body to be one, intact. In the found, in how it's set up. So, God looks on covenant, really, really, essential and important. Now. Let's, we're going to keep moving. I, I, I told you there's a couple points I'm, I'm getting to here today, but we're, we're but we're dealing with covenant in it in the foundation of it. <clears throat> Go to Zechariah two. I know some of y'all are going. You haven't used a scripture yet today, Pastor Thad. Um, I, I will. We're going to use a, a lot of scripture, but uh, just a lot of what the Holy Spirit was showing me. He just I just I had a uh, clipboard out with paper on it, just writing down stuff. And, um, but, but I will, I will use this scripture here because this is covenant. Zechariah chapter two, verse eight. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting this. I know it's just, there's a, obviously it's a little bit different, but I got something I want to to share with you real quick here. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 says this. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. And that last statement, that last phrase there says, He that touches you. And again, that that whole point is, is, He that comes against you he that rises against you, rise against the apple of his eye. That's a covenant point there. Is that, you know, if, if somebody, I had several years ago, I had somebody uh, email me. And it was just one of those things. Um, he, didn't, he didn't like the way. Um, somebody in our body taught. And uh, I mean, this, this has been probably maybe 10 years ago, if not longer. And it didn't like how somebody in our body taught. And, uh, and this person, they'd come to our church for a little bit, um, had talked a lot, jibber-jabbered a lot, and, 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 and emailed me to let me know that. And here's the problem, is that this man hadn't come into a covenant relationship. He hadn't joined me. He, was, he came to our church. There was, a, there was a possibility of that. But he had just jabbed at somebody I am in covenant with. And how, how many know one of, my great, one of my biggest 
traits as a human being and as a pastor? It's the same thing as my dad. Mercy. I'm gentle. I'm kind. You can, you can, uh, you know, Jessica was talking to me the other day that <clears throat> says, yeah, you know, people can do things to you and makes me angry. And I'm like, I don't do anything. No one does anything. She goes, are you kidding me? Um, because again, I'm, I'm, I'd rather have people be, de- well, when he sent me that email, he didn't got, did not get a dose of Pastor Thad's mercy. Why? Because he jabbed at a covenant partner of mine. And the second he did that, he came under a, a part of covenant, which is wrath. In other words, you know, we often talk about, we often talk about our two tribes in covenant, the farming tribe and the warring tribe, all right? Now, now, if they're in covenant relationship with each other, and, and this, this farming tribe has had a lifelong opposition kind of down the road of a farming tribe that all, often likes to try to come and you know, mess with their crops or whatever, because they want to be the, they want to be, that tribe down the road wants to be the, the, uh, the farmer's extraordinaire. They want to be, they want to be the ones that writes the farmer's almanac, right? They, they want to be, they want to have all the glory, and so they like to come and mess with them. Well, the warring tribe may never have ever heard of that tribe down the road. They maybe never have even had crossed paths. You know, they, they look and, the, and, 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 the, but the second that tribe starts messing with someone they're in covenant with, that tribe that's down the road that they didn't know anything about now becomes their enemy and they will rise up against them and, 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 and wipe them out, take them out. So Zachariah, keep, keep that up there for a second. It, 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 am I teaching okay here? I want us to see this. Because again, this kind of goes back to how I started this. We need to understand God's view of covenant. Because until we totally understand God's view of covenant, we can't really know what's going on in the spirit realm. He says, for he that touches you. Here's God Almighty. Almighty. Here's you in relationship, in covenant relationship with Him. His body. And down the road, there are some people who have raised up in opposition against you. And and because it's against you, it's against Him. And He says, they've touched you, therefore they've touched the apple, the covenant connection of my eye. And they have become my enemy. And I am a covenant-keeping God who keeps covenant to a thousand generations. And I have not forgotten that covenant that I've made with you. Therefore, those that touch the apple of my eye have become my enemy. And as much as people don't want to hear that, no, God's a God of love. God's a God of wrath. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I, that's not what God would do. If you touch the apple of his eyes, I will guarantee it. Remember Herod in Acts? Killed John? No, not John, obviously, James. Killed James. God gave him a disease. Now, why? 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 What was his purpose? To see him changed. Just the same way as he struck Paul blind. Paul changed. Herod didn't. Herod died. Some of you might be have an idea where I'm going next. 
<clears throat> when nations raised up, r- rose up against Israel, whole nations were destroyed because of that. I, I, I thought real quick of how about one man and a nation? Goliath rose up against the armies of God. And (laughs) rose up against the armies of God. Defied them. And God looked down and said, Not my people. Not the apple of my eye. And he sent a teenage boy out there in the most impossible looking way. And what did David talk about on the battlefield? Covenant. He brought up covenant. The covenant I have with my God. Why? Because Goliath was messing a man, was me- a big man, man who thought he was all that and a bag of chips. He was messing with the apple of God's eye. And God said, you see that man up there? He's about ready to be wiped off the face of this earth. And he was. And then everybody that backed him up and supported him was ran out of town. And I said a lot of that to say this, and this is not my end. Maybe it is, I don't know. We need to hear this. I'm a pastor. I'm not a prophet. I'm a pastor who the Holy Spirit allows me to see things for your sake. And I believe the prophets Therefore, I'll prosper. And so it is important for me to know what's going on in the spirit realm. And when the Holy Spirit speaks it to me, again, I'm not a political person. So I don't like preaching political things up here at all. But I'm going to tell you this. America's foundation is a foundation based on covenant with Yahweh. There was the Virginia Compact. These are just a couple. The Mayflower Compact. There are other compacts, other agreements. There are agreements that men, George Washington, made at the beginning of of America. And their their agreement, I was reading on this. Their basic agreement is that we are not coming to America for silver, for gold, or for our names. We are coming to America to further the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to, for his sake, for your sake, for the glory of God, Yahweh. We are coming to America so that the world will be saved. They said that at the foundation of this nation. They came into a compact, a contract, a covenant with Almighty God that says this nation is one nation under God. Now we look at what's going on and we see everything but that. And I've heard way too many people say, America's going to hell in a handbasket. No, we're not. Because first of all, America is the apple of God's eye. You may, people, and again, I, this is not up for discussion. <laughs> I, I'm not, and I know people, because you can't argue it. No, I can, I can argue it pretty well. America is the apple of God's eye. More nations have been won to Christ because of what America has done than what any other nation has done in history. America 
is God's nation. And people want to keep bringing up who's been elected and who's been put into the, the house. Okay, hey, hey, I think all of us are pretty much guaranteed to understand that there's been a whole lot of cheating going on for a long time. So uh, that starts coming into question on how many really should, how many opposition should really still be in there. But that's not my point today. Here's my point. God will never turn his back on covenant. And no matter what's going on in America right now, we do not need to stand fearful. Because there has been an infiltration to the apple of God's eye. And what's going on is that, and now, now again, we understand in um, Ephesians, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So the infiltration is really of the enemy, of the devil. And that's why God, God has spoken by his prophets many times. I've heard it, I don't know how many different prophets. He said, because is anybody trying to figure out why God didn't do something a month ago? And I know some people are like, uh, like, well, the things had to be exposed. And that's fine. I'm not, that's a, but you know why he didn't do things a month ago? You know why he didn't do things two months ago? Do you know why he didn't do just, just do something on November 3rd? And I'm, I'm, again, I know a lot of people are like, well, things had to be exposed. Yeah, everything's being exposed right now. The reason he didn't do it was because he was moving on the hearts of some of those people that the enemy had used to infiltrate America. He was working on their hearts. Have you noticed, mm, have you noticed how some of these people that in years past did, I mean, they were crazy, but they weren't demonic. And then all of a sudden, it seems like in the last year, I mean, he's, he's, He's going to be out of office. You know, they say he's going to be out of office in 13, 14, 12, 13 days, something like that. Why would you need to? Why would you need to? Um, why would you need to uh, impeach him for thirteen days? Here it is, is because, and I don't care who you are, because he represents Yahweh. And light, darkness hates light with a passion. Excuse me. Darkness hates light. Darkness hates light with a passion. And they don't want to just... They don't want to just try to scoop him under the rug... They want to try to erase him from history. They want to try to erase him from, from any books or the wall. Or he, they, they want to try to destroy this man. And I don't care who you are. And, I, and again, uh, Christians, Christians who are having a trouble with Donald Trump because of his past need to really hope that whew, that does or does not the scripture say judge not lest you be judged does or does it not say and this may be a little bit rough that with the same measure that you have judged you will be judged so every every christian that has judged donald trump's past and refute, said he can't be a godly man because of his past. The word of God says that's how you will now be judged. That if you have any past at all, don't tell me that you're a spiritual person now. If you are not allowing another man to change his life and be the man that God needs this America to be, don't tell me that. You have now just said, I don't want to be forgiven for my past trespasses.
you, my friend, have just become an enemy. You're the tribe down there that decided to attack the man of God that God placed in that White House. And you've just become an enemy. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't, think how, I don't care how righteous you think you are. I am not a political preacher. But this is not a political situation. This is a spiritual situation. Whew. <laughs> God has not forgotten about America. We are the apple of his eye. The thing that I did on Thursday and Friday, after all the craziness went on, I've got good news for you. I'm going to save the rest of this message for next week. Because I just honestly don't. I could. I, I know where I'm going, and it's, it's always put together together. But I think that this is where I'm supposed to be today, just to finish up here. But I thought, all right, I've listened to the prophets. Are the prophets jumping ship? The first prophet I came across was jumping ship. National name. That's all I'm going to say. You, if you've done any kind of research, you know who I'm talking about. He jumped ship. He issued an apology and said, I was wrong. Pastor Lisa, because I we, we got talking. What do, what do two pastors do when they can't see each other? They just text all day long. And uh, we got texting, and she she saw this man's apology. And, uh, and I guess, again, the thing that I've said about the prophets is that I'm, I'm, I'm with them. A, it, it bears witness to me, but B, if they're wrong, nobody will trust a mouthpiece of God ever again. And so, Je so Elisa was actually looking at, at, at things on uh, the comment sections. And there were several people um, who were basically saying, um, I've lost my faith through this because of you. Which is exactly what I've said. In other words, you said God said this, and now you're telling me you're wrong. How will I ever listen to a mouthpiece of God again? And uh, finally somebody, Elisa was reading through, she sent me the Photoshop, but somebody says, Sir, he said some other things, but the last line was, this will not be your last apology because you will have to apologize for your apology. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's it. It's best best one-liner I've heard, and I don't know who the guy was, but here, but, but, the, but the, again, if, if you've got YouTube, go and find Flashpoint from Victory, Victory uh, Channel. Flashpoint from Thursday night, the 8th, I believe it is what it comes out to, something like that. Um, they had five different prophets on there. And all five of them, uh, one of them was Cat Kerr. I've never heard of Cat Kerr outside of uh, Hank, uh, Hank Kuhneman has talked about her a couple times. She sat there in the lower, if you'll see the screen, she's got pink hair. And she sat down there in this lower left-hand corner of the screen the whole time, had this grin on her face like she knew something was up. And, and uh, she prophesied a couple times on it. The second time, it started off by the guy going, so now many people think that Donald Trump will get a second term, but it's going to be in like 2024. And she said, nope. She said, he's going to be president of the United States for eight consecutive terms. God showed me that. And that's the way it's going to be. And she, she went on. She was like, nope. My point is, God speaks to his covenant partners. 
And when you have been spoken to by God Almighty, and you know his voice, and you know what he's saying to you, nobody can tell you anything different. Which concerns me, the one that apologized. Just concerns me. So with that said, I'm simply telling you, keep your head up. Keep your faith up. Keep your strength up. Don't listen to the lies. Don't listen to the negative. If you Listen, if you hear negative and fear things, anything based on fear, turn it off or recognize the source of it. Even if it's, even if you feel somehow that there's good in it, if there's fear in it, it is not from God. Amen. God is a covenant-keeping God and he has a covenant for America, and he ain't done yet. Th- think about this. And I, I, I just, I'm going to wrap this up. Amen. Ab- Lazarus. Jesus gets the word that Lazarus is on his deathbed. Could Jesus have dropped everything gotten there while he was still on his bed and hurried up and healed him before he died. Probably, yeah. But it tells us in Scripture that Jesus waited two more days before he took off. Knowing that when he got there, he was going to be dead. And it was going to look as bad as possible because... Mary, man, I, I should have read the whole story. Where have you been? Did you not hear that he was dying? Did you not hear? Where have you been? Why did you wait two extra days? And Jesus cried. Because it wasn't so much about their hurt, though it was. I believe, I believe he didn't like them hurting. But he's trying to figure out where, why is it too late? Because if I've said something, if I've declared something, remember when he went to the, the, to the house of the little girl and the mourners were already in full show? What's going on in Washington, D.C. right now is a show. Everybody's out doing this little. See, that's what the mourners in those days, they would hire professional mourners. To, to come in there and to fill the house with this sadness because of the death. Of, and they would, oh, and they would mourn this loud just uh, situation because, oh, they've died. Oh, and Jesus shows up and goes, What's, why are you putting on this big show? The girl's just sleeping. And what did they do to God? Jesus. They laughed him to scorn. They started mocking him. Started mocking the words that came out of his mouth. And he kicked him out of the house. He went in. A few minutes later, this girl's out there eating a bologna sandwich. Listen, I'm not giving you a timetable. I think I, I think that I think there's going to be some things come out. I, I do. I believe there's going to be arrests. I believe there's going to be some things like that coming out. We don't need to fear. God did not make a mistake when He said, "This will be this will be a decade of the power of God and and America will be at the forefront of it." Because there's still a lot of Americans who are who who recognize that covenant. Let's stand together. I'm not a, I'm not a political pastor. I, I I listen to political things. I 
I, I follow some political people uh, on online, but I'm, that's not me. I, I don't do that. But I do. I, I am. I am your pastor, and I believe when the Holy Spirit is speaking, especially uh, speaking to me regarding things, that it becomes my job to encourage you. And again, if, if I, I think I've said everything today um, about uh, without fear. I, I, I hope I raised your faith today. Um, but this whole thing is going on is the enemy attacking God's covenant people, God's covenant nation. And so it won't stand. It won't stand. Now, one of the things I'm going to get into next week, and, and again, I didn't even come close, um, but that's okay, uh, is, is we're going to get into to what God's wanting to make himself big to the heathen. He's wanting to show the heathen who he is. But the thing that stops him are complacent Christians. So one of the reasons last year we spent so much time talking about going all in is because the one thing that will stop and or hinder what God's wanting to do is Christians um, being complacent. And we'll, we'll get more into that. And, and again, one of the things that we're going to bring up, and it's scriptural, so it's not even something that I've tried to twist into it. One of the things is, is they're complacent in relationships. And so we'll, we'll get into that next week. But um, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank that your word. Thank you that your word is life, that your word is health, it's peace, and that your word is living. Which means that not only do we have a holy book. Words breathed by God that we can read and hear your words and let it live in us. But your word also comes to us, comes to our spirit. And, and gives us insight and gives us revelation and wisdom. To where, backed up by this book, we understand that. But it gives us wisdom and insight that we can go through this life and live victoriously and live the life that you have ordained for us to live. These are not the days of woe and stress. These are the best of times, but there's also some be some worst of times for some people that don't yield and don't hear your word. And so, Father, this morning, let us hear your word. Let us hear what you're saying. That you're a covenant God. And so as long as we stay in covenant and stay in honor of that covenant with you, Lord, we have great things in store for us. And so, Father, we love you. We thank you. Let us be encouraged. Let us encourage others. The best is yet to come. We love you, Dad. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.